We'd now like to welcome from the Department of the Interior, Assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs, Brian Newland. Now, prior to accepting the role of Assistant Secretary, Mr. Newland served as president of the Bay Mills Indian Community. Many of us know Mr. Newland from his time at the department under the Obama administration. And it's great to have Brian back at the department in the capacity of Assistant Secretary. And we appreciate all the experience that he brings to this role. Assistant Secretary Newland, thank you for joining us this afternoon. We look forward to your remarks. Miigwech, uh, Governor Lewis, Buju, uh, Minogija, happy Valentine's Day, everybody. I wanna say miigwech for inviting me to join you today. Um, I know we've all been looking forward to meeting in person and I still believe that time's gonna come soon, but. Still, I appreciate the opportunity to connect with you all virtually so that we can keep everybody safe and healthy. I also wanna thank the leadership of NCAI and the NCAI staff who've helped organize this virtual midwinter convention. I know we've talked about it a lot um, ad nauseum, but the past couple of years have been hard. Everybody here at this convention has been impacted by this pandemic and this awful disease. Many of you have lost relatives, friends, and community members. Uh, for the tribal leaders here, I've shared your experience of trying to lead a tribe forward through this time, trying to keep your people safe while mapping out a vision for your people's future. I wanna offer my prayers to you and your people and express my commitment to work with you to keep your communities healthy and to support your vision for the future. In many instances, the last two years has brought out the worst in a lot of people, but we've seen it bring out the best in people too. And I believe that that's true of so much of Indian country. All across the United States, tribes have led some of the most successful public health responses that we've seen. From manufacturing PPE, to delivering food and care to elders, to vaccinating tribal and non-tribal communities alike, Tribes have served as leading examples of what's possible when we combine resources with inherent tribal values. I believe it's our job as federal officials to support your leadership at the tribal level by providing resources and working with you as a collaborative trustee to make lives better for the people in your communities. That's how I approach my role as assistant secretary. Next week marks the one year anniversary since I assumed leadership here at Indian Affairs. And it was a year ago that I appeared here at the Midwinter Convention, uh, one week into my new job wearing this red ribbon shirt. Um, it's been an intense and challenging year, but it's also been fun and rewarding. Coming into this job, I expected to rely heavily on my experience as a tribal judge, as a tribal leader, and my previous time at the Department of the Interior. Mostly though, I've relied on my experience simply growing up and living in my tribal community. I keep it in the front of my mind that the work we do at the Department of the Interior affects the daily lives of people in our tribal communities. And we built a team here that shares that understanding. I'm proud of what we've done in this short amount of time, both in delivering results and in laying the foundation for the work we're going to do in the coming years. I've seen real change on the ground, both in my own community and many of yours that have had the chance to visit this last year. When the administration hosted the Tribal Nations Summit in November, it restored an important opportunity for meaningful dialogue with tribal leaders on key issues, policy initiatives, and goals for Indian country. The steps that we've taken over the past year will lay the foundation for our shared project in the future to ensure that every single native person has the right to live safe, healthy and fulfilling lives together as tribal people in their tribal homelands. This guiding principle is a direct response to the legacy of colonization, which sought to take these things from native people. Our work is gonna be rooted in this principle. Together, we can begin the process of healing the scars left in our communities from the process of colonization and termination. We know that these scars were formed over centuries and we know that we're not going to erase them in four years. It's the work of generations, but it's also our work. We're gonna to work to ensure that every tribe has a homeland 
where people can live together and carry forward your way of life. This will include continuing our efforts to consolidate tribal lands, which is reflected in President Biden's last budget. It will include improving the land and the trust process. We've taken steps to do that in the past year, more than doubling the number of acquisitions of land in the trust status. It will also include supporting tribally led conservation of lands to support our climate response, the exercise of treaty and subsistence rights, and the protection of religious rights. We're going to protect and heal families in our tribal communities. This will include telling the truth about the legacy of boarding schools through the Secretary's Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative. It will include defending the Indian Child Welfare Act. It will also include ramping up our efforts to keep people safe in tribal communities. We're focusing on public safety, beginning with the launch of the missing and murdered unit within the BIA. And you can find more information about this effort at BIA.gov backslash MMU, in, uh, where we have a new website dedicated to solving missing and murdered cases in Indian country. Investigating cases in our communities and pursuing justice for those impacted by violence is incredibly important, but we also need to address the underlying issues that have led to that crisis. We're taking meaningful steps to improve the correction system in Indian country to protect the rights, dignity, and safety of the people who are in our custody. Early on in my time here at the department, we became aware of more than a dozen inmate deaths that occurred at BI funded correctional facilities over the previous five years. At my direction, the BI launched a three month review last fall, including commissioning a third party report to review current conditions in our BI funded detention facilities. Some of you may have seen reports last week on the nature of the contracting process surrounding this review, and I understand some of the scrutiny it's receiving. As a political appointee, I don't get involved in procurement decisions, but I do work to make sure that our process is ethical and fair. I intend to make sure this contract was awarded in an ethical and fair manner in accordance with the law. Now this report lays out recommendations for us that are informed by an assessment of the thoroughness and effectiveness of in-custody death investigations. Today, based on the report's findings and our review, have announced a reform plan based on 28 actions to improve our detention facility operations and investigations. This plan is based on the principle that we must recognize the dignity and the humanity of the people in our custody. I grew up as the son of a corrections officer. I take this issue very seriously. That's why our action plan will include improving our process for conducting cell checks and responding to medical emergencies, updating policies and implementing consistent standards across facilities, improving recruitment, retention, training, and morale of staff, and improving our coordination with other federal agencies like IHS and the Department of Justice to ensure the safety for our inmates and accountability for ourselves. We value the well-being of people, those in our custody as well as our officers responsible for providing a safe environment. Finally, we're gonna partner with you to ensure that tribal ways of knowing, ways of praying, and ways of speaking are protected and revitalized. This will include our actions to protect sacred places and incorporate traditional knowledge into the science that informs our decision-making. It will also include the steps we're taking to invest in language revitalization and to collaborate with tribes and community organizations on this important work. With the support of President Biden, Vice President Harris, and Secretary Holland here at the department, I'm really excited about what we can achieve. The president's agenda for the country focuses on healing and building back better. That agenda guides what we're doing here in Indian Affairs and across the administration to make life better for people in tribal communities. I'm grateful for your service to your tribal people and your communities and to all of Indian country. Serving in leadership in tribal communities is hard. I know it can be frustrating and bruising, but it's also rewarding and vitally important. I'm excited about what we're doing together. I know that our shared project is intergenerational. The healing and the strengthening won't be finished in one term or even one generation, but we're going to make serious progress over these next few years, and we're gonna do it together, miigwech. 
Thank you so much, Assistant Secretary Newland. Uh, and it, it's been a quick it's been a quick year since since you took office, and uh, you know, with the tribes are, are so appreciative of your leadership during this time, especially being a past tribal leader as well. Now, I see some questions in the chat uh, that I'd like to uh, ask you. Um, a lot of what has been discussed by the Attorney General and Secretary of Interior addresses non-public law 280 states. Uh, what about tribes located in those public law 280 states? How can the Department of Justice and uh, Department of Interior help with resource voids or lack of equity in these states? Um, thanks, Governor Lewis. Well, as you've seen with the president's executive order, um, you know, we need to do a, a better job of coordinating law enforcement response and, and making investments in public safety in tribal communities. But the real problem is on the front end. And um, that's where President Biden's executive order also directs our attention to work on violence protection and healing um, a lot of uh, trauma in our communities and making sure that um, you know, people get the help they need and that we're preventing violence on the front end through public health, providing people access to mental health uh, resources. And it's gonna take a collaborative effort. Okay, thank you for that, uh, that the, the question. Now, the, the next one is uh, that I'd like to pose to you is when will the Not Invisible Act Commission be filled and, and begin work? Yeah, that's a great question, Governor. We're, we're in the process right now of um, standing up that commission um, and uh, uh, putting it in place. I don't have a date for you uh, just yet, but I, I can tell you that this is one of our uh, cornerstone pieces of our work to uh, improve public safety and really get recommendations from people on uh, the steps we can take. And the, the valuable, uh, one of the most valuable parts of the Not Invisible Act Commission is the requirement for uh, diverse representation of uh, people from across Indian country, including survivors, um, and getting their perspective in, in grassroots um, organizations and um, leaders who uh, really deal with um, finding missing people in tribal communities, um, it, getting their perspective at the table with federal officials is gonna be key. Okay, we have a question from Ambassador Lance Gums from the Shinnecock Indian Nation, and also he's a, a regional vice president for NCAI. I'd like to call on him and I'm gonna try to uh, see if, if he can answer this or pose this question live. Can you hear me, uh, Governor? I can hear you, coming in loud and clear, sir. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, and thank you, uh, Assistant Newland, uh, Se Assistant Secretary Newland, uh, for taking this question. Um, the previous administration moved to eliminate some of the bureaucratic red tape that had bogged down uh, tribal advancement in, in many areas. Um, the department's relationship with tribes uh, although it has improved uh, under your watch and, and under the secretary's watch, it's still a little bit too paternalistic and inflexible. So moving forward, um, will the department commit to improve its process to acquire trust lands and acknowledge restricted fee lands that have been held by tribes untaxed since time immemorial by adopting a strategy of providing technical assistance and working more collaboratively with tribes in that process, in the, in the process of uh, acquiring land. And it's, it's sort of a two part because tribes similar to mine and, and here in the Northeast have the Cartieri issue. And since it's going on 13 years now since um, the Cartieri issue came to light and there has still been no fix, there needs to be a more collaborative effort. So that's my question. Uh, uh, thanks, Ambassador Gums. You know, I could uh, probably uh, spend the rest of the afternoon um, uh, talking about uh, land in the trust and, and um, the uh, department's responsibilities for leasing and rights of way and improving that process. And, um, you know, those are things that uh, get me out of bed every day and, and that I uh, geek out about. Um, you know, I, I can tell you this, Ambassador, is that um, we're 
we are working hard to make that process work better. Uh, we had a, consult, a tribal consultation session um, at last fall and received a number of uh, written comments from across Indian country on ways to improve the land and the trust process, ways to uh, address the leasing uh, process and, and to do some of the things that you're talking about is making it simpler and more effective for tribes. And uh, we've also uh, had a number of conversations internally about restricted fee lands. Um, and uh, what I can tell you is this, that um, you know, that's, a, that's a key part of the president's commitment is to restore tribal homelands. We're, we're looking at a number of ways to do that. Last year in the president's budget request, um, he requested $10 million for secretarial acquisition of lands for uh, landless and recently recognized tribes. That is under an authority uh, under the Indian Reorganization Act that hasn't been exercised by the department in a long, long time. Uh, the president has also requested money uh, to continue our land consolidation efforts beyond the expiration of the Cobell settlement. And um, you know we're, we're doing work on the leasing front, the rights of way front for a lot of the infrastructure that's gonna be funded by the bipartisan infrastructure law. Um, and, and many more that we're not, um, you know, that, that we're working on that we're not um, quite there yet to discuss, but um, this, is, this is one of the cornerstones of what we're gonna be doing here at the department. Thank you, thank you for that, I appreciate it. Now I'm gonna call on uh, Dr. Juana uh, Mayhill Dixon. I know she's been a long time advocate in Indian country. Would you like to uh, ask your question live, Dr. Dixon? Okay, if, if not, we can go on. Um, and, and this really, you know, I, I, if, if you can maybe speak more about, uh, I know you've had, a, again, a challenging time uh, in Indian country uh, while serving uh, as a new assistant secretary, unprecedented time given the, given the pandemic, uh, but also unprecedented because of the historic levels of relief funding and infrastructure funding the administration and Congress have provided to, to tribal governments. And this funding is a strong acknowledgement of the status of Indian nations, uh, but also the need of communities, our communities that, that, have, have, that have due to the decades of underfunding and, and the lack of, of investment in infrastructure. Can you share some of your observations about those successes, challenges and innovations that you've observed throughout Indian country uh, as we have worked to protect our communities and rebuild our infrastructure during these unprecedented times? Um, thanks, Governor. Uh, you know, first, I, I, I do want to say you know, these, these jobs are challenging um, here at the department, but uh, I also know that uh, those of you serving in tribal leadership um, have very challenging jobs. And it, one difference I noticed uh, moving from tribal leadership to here is that um, I don't get cornered in the grocery store or at the gas station um, like I used to do about uh, issues. Um, and it, it's also rewarding and fun. Um, I've learned a lot from uh, working with many of you and, and visiting your communities. And um, it's, it really has, uh, I know Secretary Holland feels the same way. It's just been incredible to um, have so many folks reach out and just offer support in, in prayers. And um, that means a lot. It's, it, this is a really rewarding privilege to serve in this position. Uh, with some of the observations about um, this funding is, I mean, I, I continue to stop and, and just uh, take a breath and, and think about how unprecedented this investment in Indian country really is. The, the United States has never made this level of investment in Indian country ever in, in its history. Um, through the rescue plan, the infrastructure law, uh, the appropriations requests. Um, it, I've seen a lot of tribes really be successful with uh, uh, 105L leasing, which is a leasing program under the Self-Determination Act um, that really uh, empowers tribes uh, to develop infrastructure in their communities. Um, I've really watched a lot of tribes um, 
well, this is outside the Department of the Interior, a, a lot of tribes um, make investments in, in healthcare. I think the pandemic has really spurred um, investments in uh, community healthcare facilities and programs in tribal communities. We're seeing tribes be leaders in, in providing healthcare um, in, in rural America. And um, these are, these are because we're all so close to it, sometimes it's hard to step back and, and have that perspective. But when you do take that, that beat, take that breath, um, to take stock of where we are, it's, it's exciting. It really is. We've never kind of been at this moment. And um, I know Assistant Secretary Connor is here too. And I just want to um, add, Governor, that um, you know, from my previous time serving here at the department to now, um, in addition to Secretary Holland, there's just incredibly talented and brilliant um, uh, representation from across Indian country, across federal agencies that have not had that uh, level of uh, you know, representation. People, uh, whether it's at Department of Defense or Commerce or Transportation, people who haven't come in with the breadth of experience and knowledge of um, Indian country across the federal government and also onto the federal bench. I mean, these are, these are exciting times if, if you're into this stuff, which you're here, so you're into this stuff. Um, and I think when we get the benefit of time and perspective, we're gonna look back on this and say, wow, that, was, that, that period was really something for Indian country. Okay, I'll go on to the next question. Uh, that, that I received. Um, today you announced a series of reforms to the Office of Justice Services, the correctional program intended to protect the rights, dignity, and safety of those who are in custody at the BIA facilities. Can you elaborate on that announcement and what you hope the outcome will be of these reforms? Yeah, thanks, Governor. You know, um, when, when, when people are incarcerated and, and they're held in jail, um, they're at um, the, the total control of the government that's, um, that has them in custody for their health, their safety, their welfare. Um, and you know, one, of the, one of the things that we're trying to do here is instill a, a value system um, that recognizes the humanity of the people who are in custody. You know, they're, they're, people are um, placed into jail for lots of different reasons, but they're still people. Um, there are relatives, there are community members, and it's our responsibility to take care of them. And so that's, that's at the core of what we're trying to do. Now, um, some of the things, there's not a silver bullet solution here that's uh, one thing that's going to make our detention program better and safer for inmates. It's going to take a lot of serious nitty gritty work. And that's some of the things we're gonna to try to do. Um, improving the way we do cell checks um, at these jails so that officers uh, are making the rounds and checking on inmates um, on a regular basis and doing that in a way that can't be falsified uh, in written locks. We're trying to improve the way that we uh, do intake for people and better assess if they have mental health emergencies or medical emergencies or need special monitoring on the front end. Um, we're gonna work together with um, our partners at DOJ and, and IHS um, to make sure that uh, we have uh, better coordination on providing healthcare to inmates, especially in medical emergencies. And that we're also doing our investigations when uh, people um, die in jail or, or are harmed in jail that there's accountability. And those investigations are important for improvement because when those invest investigations are done well and they're done right, they show us what happened, not only uh, to hold people accountable, but to fix problems. And so these are some of the things that, um, that we're going to do. Okay, well, we're going to wrap up now. I think we had an excellent discussion with you. Thank you again, Assistant Secretary Newland, for your comments here today and your commitment continuing commitment to working with Indian Country and with NCAI. We look forward to continuing to work together on these foundational policies that enhance tribal sovereignty and self-determination. These have been such important discussions about the critical issues impacting our membership, 
across NCI and Indian country. And we look forward to a continued dialogue with the administration about these and other issues of importance. Thank you. Thank you, Rich, Governor, and happy Valentine's Day again to everybody. I, I, I hope you uh, find some time to celebrate.